what would you consider to be your most embarrassing moment? I know, I'm not gonna make you write it in the comments, I promise. There's a most embarrassing moment that most of us can talk about though. The thing that you really hope that no one will ever bring up again, the, the thing that just embarrassed you the most, probably it was when you were in school or maybe even at work. I hope that it wasn't wetting your pants at school or some wardrobe malfunction in your office place. I definitely hope that you didn't wet your pants in your office place. That would be even worse. Um, I remember my most embarrassing moment, or at least one of them. One of the most embarrassing moments, some of you might remind me later of others, but I remember that most embarrassing moment. It was back when I was in fifth grade and I was on the playground. Back in my fifth grade days, there were monkey bars that you could do flips over and those big merry-go-rounds that you could get drug along with if you didn't run fast enough. The playground was a little bit of a dangerous place, but it was especially dangerous for fifth grade me. It was back in the time when girls and boys were just starting to notice one another, and yet we still didn't really want to talk about it. There were kids who couldn't go anywhere who started going together, whatever that meant. Passing notes was too risky in class, and so we would pass our notes on the playground. And that day, the most popular girl in my class came running up to me on the playground. She handed me a note. And nerdy little me didn't understand that there should have been a lot of red flags about that happening. She handed me a note, and when I unfolded it, it said, will you go with me? Check yes or no. Who's it from? I asked her. And she named a boy that everyone in my class would have called the funniest kid in class. <sighs> then she handed me a mechanical pencil. I took it from her and I checked yes. I folded up the note and tucked that little tab back in and gave it back to her to deliver for me. She ran off to her friend group in the corner and just a hushed moment later, it all burst into laughter. They all turned around and looked at me and pointed and laughed. The funny kid didn't want to go with me. The funny kid's friends wanted to laugh at me. And what about your story? What about your most embarrassing moment? Is there something that you would rather everyone not know? Is there something that everyone burst into laughter about? Perhaps it's still hard to remember that story. There are emotions that come up inside of us even now when we can look back and laugh. There are emotions that show up inside of us when we remember those embarrassing moments. I can laugh at gullible, nerdy little me a lot right now, but there's still a little bit of hurt inside there. Still a little bit of what we call shame. And maybe for you, that wasn't something that you had happened to you or something that you did. But the story that comes up inside of you when you tell yourself that story now, it tells you less about the things that happened and more about who you are. That feeling of shame is one you can't just cover over or run away from or outgrow. Sometimes 
there's laughter that covers the shame. But no matter what your story is, you and I, we've all felt that feeling of shame. Just like the playground bully, shame doesn't just go away. And just like that playground merry-go-round, shame just keeps coming back around. Well, today I want you to know that there is a way off of that merry-go-round of shame and an escape from that playground bully because the cycle of shame is broken by grace. Today we're going to go back to the beginning, to the beginning of shame, of how we got on this shame cycle to begin with, back to the very, very beginning, to humanity's most embarrassing moment. We find it documented for us and for all posterity in Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Today we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. Here's how the story of humanity's most embarrassing moment goes. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make her a helper suitable for him. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. In the garden, at the beginning, Adam and Eve were free. They were free and they had one rule. What was that rule? It was don't eat. But, but don't eat from what? Don't eat from that, that one tree. That one tree in the middle. Don't, don't eat from that one. And why not eat from that one? Well, God says it's because when you eat of it, you will certainly die. Now, interestingly enough, God says when you eat of it, you will die. Not if you eat of it, but when you eat of it. You'll know you have done wrong and you'll die. You'll know you've done wrong. We're going to come back to that in a minute. But but first, let's think about what that freedom would be like. What would it be like to be that free? God tells Adam that he is free to eat. It's like the world's best all-you-can-eat buffet. Whatever you want, just take it. And no... No worrying about the consequences of what you're going to eat. No wondering if those pants are going to fit tomorrow, if you choose to eat this and this and this. No wondering about whether it's better to eat dessert or to eat salad. There's no wondering about food allergies or food sensitivities. There's no holding back your own appetite, and there's no overindulging. They're just free, free to eat whatever they choose. That's really hard to imagine. And that freedom isn't just about what they eat. It is also about how they relate to one another. They're free in their relationships as well as in how they eat. See how the man says about the woman that This one is like me. 
They understand each other. They are together. They were free in their relationships. They were together and without shame. Without shame. What would, what would that be like? Can you even imagine that? Can you imagine a world in which the people closest to us knew everything about us and we didn't feel any need to cover it up or spin the story to our advantage because we were free? Can you even imagine that? Well, it's hard. It's hard to imagine that because of what happens next. And that's what God knew was going to happen from the very beginning. The warning was not, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but when you eat from it. And it didn't take long. In Genesis 3, verse 1, we read this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat from the trees, of the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Well, the serpent here is a master manipulator. He's an excellent but evil negotiator. And like a great negotiator, he asks her a question up front that is ridiculous. Did God really say you must not eat any of the trees? He gets his quick no, like the master negotiator that he is. He opens the door for his treacherous negotiation. Did God really say you can't eat anything? Of course not. There's a subtle progression here. The serpent first introduces doubt. That doubt creates an opening, and that opening is the opportunity for the lie. Where is the doubt introduced here in this verse? Can you find where he introduces the doubt? He asks her a question up front that doesn't specifically say you can't trust God but it creates a question inside of her. Did God really say? And what does she answer? In effect, no. God didn't really say that. But that's the opening of doubt that the serpent has placed inside of her. Did God really say this? I'm not sure. That's not what I think he said. What did he really say? And, and why did he say it? That opening of doubt is now there. And into that opening, the serpent inserts the lie. Can you find the lie in what the serpent is telling Eve? The lie of the serpent is the part that isn't true in his statement here. He says, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. That part's true. 
And the ending, knowing good and evil, is also true. But it's that little bit in the middle that isn't quite right. And you will be like God. Is there any possibility of Adam and Eve being like God? They know God. They know who he is. They know that he is the creator and they are the creation. They know that he is eternal and that they had a beginning. They know a lot of things about God that would help them know in a moment like this that they will not be like God. But because of the doubt that the serpent has inserted and created this opening, the lie, the lie is heard. And here's what it says. You will be like God is a lie. But he has successfully convinced the woman and the man that's standing there with her that God is is against her, that he has left out or ruled out something, that he is holding back something that would be good for her. And she acts on this new and false belief that God is against her. After she eats, her husband also eats. And then what happens to them? In verse 7, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Their eyes were opened. They did know good and evil. In that moment, they knew that they had done evil. The fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the fruit of that tree of knowledge of good and evil is shame. No wonder God didn't want them to eat it. They knew that they had done evil. And with that knowledge, their actions, that their actions were wrong. Shame entered the world as the bully that it is. And when shame enters the world, it gets right to work. And its ways are crafty and underhanded. The first thing that shame does is it makes them aware of their guilt. Immediately they knew that they had done wrong, that they were guilty. They immediately knew that. Shame revealed good and evil, and it told them what you have done is wrong. The second thing that shame does right after that is that it makes their guilt turn into a vulnerability. It makes them aware that they are naked. They look around and they realize that their guilt puts them at risk. What is going to happen now? They used to feel no shame. And now shame tells them, you're naked, you're exposed, you are at risk. And so they begin to hide. And this is what humanity has been doing ever since. They try, at least, to hide. It's kind of hard. They're, they're trying to use leaves. Um, leaves don't work too well. Hiding takes two forms here. The first one, they try to cover up. But it doesn't work. The the leaves are just inadequate for this kind of hiding. They've seen that in the trees that the leaves sometimes will, will keep them from seeing the fruit that's behind. And so they think, ah, leaves, that's what we'll use to cover ourselves up. 
but these leaves aren't going to do the job. The leaves can't hide them from the fruit of the decisions that they have made. But we already know that. We know that leaves are inadequate for this kind of hiding. We've tried to hide by covering things up ourselves. We know because shame makes us want to hide. It makes us want to hide from others not only what we've done, but also what we've become. And since covering up doesn't work very well, they try the next form of hiding. They try going away from one another. Maybe if a couple of leaves don't work, maybe a whole bush full of leaves will work. And then maybe if we each have our own bush full of leaves, that will work. And so the hiding turns into separation. It's hard to hide together. Have you ever played the old game of hide and seek called sardines? Sardines is sort of the inverse of hide and seek. Instead of everybody hiding and one person going to find them, one person hides and everyone else tries to find them. But when you find them, you don't just yell out, I found him. You hide with them. So that one person hiding becomes two people hiding and trying to share the same space. And then when you're found by a third person, then the numbers start to multiply until almost everyone is there. And the last person to find you is the next person that gets to start by hiding. But sardines doesn't work very well because a lot of times the the hiding place can barely support one or two people, much less a whole bunch of your friends. Hiding together doesn't make sense. It's much more effective to hide separately. It's much more effective for hiding, and it's much more effective for shame to keep us separated. Have you ever played hide and seek and felt after just a few moments that no one was even looking for you? That they might just let you stay hiding forever? That no one would ever come to find you? And I wonder, in the garden, on those, that first day when humanity first felt shame and first tried to hide. If Adam and Eve felt like that, if they felt like this is just going to be how it is, that no one will ever come and find me. I imagine that these were new and scary feelings for Adam and Eve. I imagine that on the day when humanity's hiding began, that the, they felt for the first time loneliness. They felt for the first time fear as they tried to hide from one another and from God and didn't know what would happen next. Now let's take a time out from the text for a minute to imagine. Imagine what would have happened if they had just stayed hiding. They might have forever lived apart from one another. They might have forever lived apart from God. If they just stay hiding, they will maybe be safe. They're hiding because they feel afraid and exposed, and they're looking for security in the bush they're hiding behind and the leaves they've put on. 
But if they keep hiding, they won't be able to do any of the things that God has made them to do. They won't be able to work together. They won't be able to take care of a garden together. They won't be able to rely on one another. They won't be able to be fruitful or multiply. They won't be able to have any kind of relationship with God. Because continuing to hide will keep them from everything that they were made for. Unless something or someone breaks the cycle of shame, there's no hope. There's no hope for them to ever be reunited. And right there, in that moment of them hiding and trying to stay separate, we see the very first glimpse of hope. It is the first hint of a solution. It is the first instance in all of history of the one thing that can break the cycle of shame, and that is grace. In Genesis 3, verses 8 and 9, it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Do you think that God doesn't know where they are? Of course not. He's God. He knows exactly where they are. He feels this separation that is taking place, and he knows exactly what has happened. He knows that they're trying to hide, both from one another and from him, but God doesn't operate in shame. God operates in grace because that is who he is. What is this grace? Grace is is maybe misunderstood sometimes as just a, oh, it'll be fine. Just dismiss all of the problems that are happening. Just, Just another way of covering over what has happened. But that isn't grace. Grace is undeserved movement of one person towards relationship. Grace is undeserved movement of someone towards relationship. God knows that they are moving away from him. They're trying to hide. And he knows that the reason that this is happening is because they have done something wrong. They have broken his command that they are moving away from him because they feel shame. But he also knows that if he doesn't move towards them, that they will always be moving away from one another. And so, even though they don't deserve it, God takes the first step towards them. He doesn't hide from them like they would expect. He he doesn't hide. He doesn't go away from them because they're wrong. He instead moves towards them. He seeks them out. While they are hiding, trying to get away from the weight of knowing good and evil, grace finds them in their shame. When we are hiding, grace finds us in our shame. And let's just sit in that for a moment. The fact that we don't deserve anyone to come find us when we have done wrong. Grace is not at all what we expect. 
And whether you've been in church every Sunday of your entire life, or whether this is the first time you've tuned in just a few minutes ago, we all expect that when we do wrong, when we go against God's rules, that he is going to turn his back on us. We all expect God to walk away. And that is not what God does. This is the story that our shame tells us, is that we deserve God to walk away. But instead, God seeks us out. God seeks them out. In verse 9, it says, But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Because grace finds us in our shame. And Adam and Eve receive this grace as they come out of hiding. They come out of their hiding places and they talk to God. Adam answers God's seeking. He lays out the shame cycle very clearly here in verse 10. In Genesis 3.10, he, Adam, answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. The cycle starts with knowing that we have done something wrong. We feel guilt. And the cycle of shame is still working in the man and the woman. And it has one more stop on its way around. Because first things go wrong in them, and then they go wrong between them. And shame's cycle goes around from guilt to fear to hiding to separation. And then on its way back around, it tries to put the guilt on someone else. And we begin to blame. In verse 11, it says, And he, that's God, said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman that you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Well, the cycle of shame just doesn't stop. It keeps on its awful, terrible, evil merry-go-round of coming back around and around and around again. Guilt leads to fear. Fear leads to hiding. Hiding leads to separation. And then it leads to blame. It tries to include someone else in the horrible shame game by putting the guilt on them. Because misery loves company, and shame is definitely miserable. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. And the serpent doesn't get a chance because God doesn't play the blame game. He doesn't give the serpent a chance to answer. Instead, he shows all of them grace. And why? Why would he not just strike all of them dead right there? That, that's what was promised, that if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. Why would he not just give them that certain death right then that he had warned them about, that he had told them would be the consequence of their disobedience? Why doesn't he just kill them all? Why not? Why not just be done with them? Because that's what we expect and even now, we still expect this. We expect God to just be done with us. But the reason is because grace is not just something God does occasionally. 
It's not just something he decides that he's going to give once in a while. It is part of who he is. And to be consistent with who he is, he acts in grace. When God later on in the Bible tells Moses who he is, he tells him that grace is who he is. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, God tells Moses exactly who he is. He passed in front of Moses, it says, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. This is not in God's character to just walk away, to just mete out judgment immediately. It is in God's character to show them grace. And so when he acts, God always acts consistently with who he is. And this is no exception. God shows these two people grace. He tells Adam and Eve and even the serpent what the results of their behavior will be. But he keeps giving grace. It turns out that what is commonly called the curse ends up being an expression of God's grace. He doesn't give them what they deserve. He gives them grace. Grace is undeserved movement towards relationship. And that is what God gives Adam and Eve. We see him clothe them to cover them more adequately. He protects them. He even gives the first promise of a savior to come. And from that day forward, God just keeps giving grace. But shame has been with us ever since humanity had its most embarrassing moment there in the Garden of Eden. It's the universal human experience. None of us escapes it. We all ride on this terrible merry-go-round of the cycle of shame. We all get beat up by this awful playground bully. But there is a seed of hope here. Even from the very beginning, when God could have walked away from humanity, he chose instead to find us. Grace finds us in our shame. And that Savior that was promised to Adam and Eve also could have decided not to come. But instead, he chose not only to find us, but also to become one of us. Grace finds us in our shame. And next week, if you tune in again, we're going to see how this Savior that was promised from the very beginning not only finds us in our shame, but also frees people with his grace. This week, as you go about your regular daily life, you might notice shame acting like the bully that it is. The thing about a bully is that they only have power if we keep letting them have power. You might notice that shame is telling you that you are exposed, that you are vulnerable. You might notice shame tempting you to cover up something or to put some distance between you and that other person. You might be tempted even to blame someone. 
But when you see shame acting like the bully that it is in your regular life this week, remember that shame is just a bully. That grace finds us in our shame and grace breaks the cycle of shame. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your grace. Thank you that you didn't turn away from Adam and Eve that day and that you don't turn away from any of us. Thank you that you still pursue relationship with us even though we definitely don't deserve it. Thank you that grace finds us in our shame. I'll see you next week.